now make my submissions in light of it. We say that consistently with Strasbourg's general approach, the court here has taken a non-technical approach to the identification of indirect discrimination. And so the, the court didn't consider it necessary formally to identify a comparator group. And then importantly, the part-time group to whom the combined method applied included both men and women, just like the universal credit childcare group includes both men and women. And if one were to compare the men and women in the part-time group in Detrizio, then on the Secretary of State's analysis, there would be no indirect discrimination. And that's because the combined method applied to all men and to all women in the part-time group in the same way. To make that good, could I just show you one more passage of the judgment? I don't know whether the files have gone away. Um, it's the second volume of authorities, tab 35. And if one looks, please, at page 1230. of the page under the heading the parties submissions at the end of the penultimate line it reads it was true that the combined method had the same consequences irrespective of whether the man or the woman engaged in part-time paid work and carried out household tasks And so if the Secretary of State were right in her approach to Article 14 discrimination, the court, Strasbourg Court, couldn't have taken, couldn't have come to the conclusion <coughs> that it came to in Is that right? Because um, if you had a smaller cohort, um, which was all part-time workers, the combined method applies across the board, so it's neutral in that respect, and it has the same effect on all of them. In other words, it's calculated in exactly the same way. But because more women than men are part-time workers, the impact is greater on them. Isn't that what they're saying in 69? Well, yes, which is, in my respectful submission, what the, the conclusion the judge came to in his first approach. It's the same approach. The only question is whether the, and I'm going to come to this in a moment, the only question is whether one can properly compare the childcare group to the housing group in the same way as the court in Detrizio implicitly compared the part-time group to the full-time group. Yes, they were, they, they were comparing different species of workers who were entitled to disability benefits. Yes, exactly. But the point I'm making here is that if one looks at, if one compares only men and women to whom the rule applies, mm. you couldn't get discrimination. Because it has the same effect and applies to the same proportion of the men in the group as to the women in the group. Mm. That's the only point I'm making. The next thing we note about Detrizio 
is that standing back, well, the court is taking the approach of standing back and saying that a rule that unjustifiably impedes gender equality is indirectly discriminatory against women. Sorry, say that again? A rule that unjustifiably impedes gender equality is indirectly discriminatory against women. That's a proposition well, by you, is it? Well, that's my interpretation of what the court is in doing is doing in Detrizio. So, my lord will recall that we looked before lunch at the passages of the section on justification at 1237 and 1238, where the court says the combined method is no longer consistent with efforts to achieve gender equality in the contemporary society. Well, that would... Uh, it's such a vague proposition. I don't quite, well, understand, I, I don't quite understand how it... Are you suggesting it would, the, the proposition in that form goes wider than other Strasbourg definitions of, of indirect discrimination? Well, I suppose I'm saying no more than um, it, 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 it helps to understand why Strasbourg is taking a non-technical approach to comparative groups. It, it's when, when, when looking at the looser approach to comparisons, the touchstone is really an instinctive one. Like that. Well, this one, is law, one, not well so one could make the same criticism of a lot, a lot of Strasbourg approaches to, to status, to ambit, and so forth. But the where, where Strasbourg always wants to get to is the question of justification. But anyway, could I, could I, could I, I, I accept that that's not a very attractive submission for an English court. Could I, could I, um, could I put it this way? That although the um, European court didn't analyse comparative groups. If one were to superimpose comparative groups onto the court's analysis, what it appears to be doing is comparing the proportion of women in the group to whom the rule applies, the part-time combined method group, with the proportion of women in the wider group of disability benefit claimants. And in that way, it's not what it Sorry, expresses. Sorry, just to ma say it again, comparison is. If you were going to do that, the comparison is between? Between the proportion of women in the group to whom the rule applies. Yeah. That's the part-time combined method group. Yeah. Compared to the proportion of women in the wider group of disability benefit recipients. And one could put that on a narrower basis of compared to the full-time group or on the broader basis of comparison to the entire cohort. Well, it's the latter, isn't it? Well, I, I think it more, probably is. There are, there are more women in the cohort of part-time workers there are, than there are in the full-time workers. Yes. So what you're comparing is how you deal with disability benefits in relation to the group of workers as a whole, you say. Um, but, that, but the differential treatment of part-time workers impacts more on women than it would on men. Yes. Simply because of the numbers. Yes. Adverse rule as it applies to different numbers. And in my submission in that way, the court's approach in traditio, in the in traditio, was strikingly similar to the first way in which Mr. Justice Chamberlain approached the issue. So, in our case, over eighty percent of those to whom the proof of payment rule applies are women, whereas there's no suggestion from any anywhere that there's an over-representation of one sex in the group claiming the housing element, or indeed any other element. And that, that's the same with the difference in uh, detritio de, de, de between the combined method group and the non-combined method group. So 
in our submission, this is authority for the proposition that you can compare the group to whom the, to whom the rule applies against the wider group benefit claimants. So if within a, just so I understand the, the submission, you have a general group of people who are claiming universal credit, which is made up of various elements. Some people within that group will be entitled to certain elements and certain, uh, and others will not. Uh, and within that larger group, there is a group of people who would be claiming childcare element, and more of those are women than men. So you say that a requirement in that, in the context of that type of claim, that you should pay um, the money before you recoup it back, the childcare, is bound to have a disproportionate impact on women rather than men, simply by virtue of the fact that you're required to pay it up front, even if you don't look at the question of the economic impact. That the argument? Exactly. So it's completely so, separate from the economic impact so argument. So the e economic impact argument comes in if you're wrong about that. Exactly. You're looking at the smaller cohort. Exactly. I follow. And you say that's not dissimilar, presumably, to what was the approach taken in SC, which seems to have looked at on, on a wider basis. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to advance that submission in part because it was rejected by the judge. Yeah. Okay. This is a slightly different analysis. And one can one can make it a bit more real, a bit more comparable with a with a hypothetical. I know that not, not always helpful. Um, suppose that universal credit had a part-time worker element and a full-time worker element. Mm. And the proof of payment rule applied to the part-time element, but not the full-time element. Well, that would be exactly detritio. Yeah. It's just that we're talking about slightly different things. And I need to come back, and I'm going to, on whether the two groups are properly comparable. Mm. So that was, the, that was the second of my uh, five points. I'd begun by saying, broader approach to comparators. My second point was the Tritzio. Um, my third point is to pick up the analogy that was drawn by Mr Justice Chamberlain of an employer who has two offices. Let's suppose it's one in London and one in Birmingham. And let's suppose that the employer pays the uh, employees at the Birmingham office less. If the Birmingham office has more women than men and the London office doesn't, then there, that is prima facie sex discrimination, which requires justification. Now, of course, it might easily be justified. For example, a more competitive labour market in London. But it needs to be justified. And as my, my Lord, the Vice President, pointed out in argument yesterday, this kind of indirect discrimination is actually recognised in EU law. And can I just ask my uh, ask, ask the court please to turn up to the third of the tabs in that additional bundle. This is an equal pay case called Hack Against the Audit Commission. And could I ask you, um, please, to turn to page internal page six. Where, where, where there's a, 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 the Court of Appeal identifies uh, applicable principles. It's Lord Justice Mummery. Can I ask you please to read paragraphs 50 and 51? 
judge was, was, was plainly right to say that his analogy worked as a matter of indirect discrimination. Whether or not it's properly an analogy to our situation is another matter. <laughs> Um, so that was the third of my five points, just to point out this, this class, this recognised class of indirect discrimination. Nobody, as far as I'm aware, has ever really theoretically produced a clear theoretical basis for what I might call entropy discrimination, if you're aware of any. Um, but it's certainly well established in the EU jurisprudence, as you say, and therefore also in domestic jurisprudence when applying EU law. Um, so my, the fourth of my five points is then to ask the question, is the housing group properly comparable to the childcare group in the way that's discussed in AL Serbia? We say that they are comparable because they are both components of universal credit and, in the Secretary of State's words, universal credit is a single integrated benefit. That is the way it is described in the white paper, in the equality impact assessment, and so forth. The, the um, uh, Secretary of State's material is at pains to show that what one is dealing with is not a series of separate benefits that are clumped together, but a single indivisible benefit, albeit that it's calculated in different ways in different circumstances. Just to make sure I understand, you have a single benefit which has a number of disparate elements which may or may not be claimed by an individual. Um, if one of those elements of the single benefit applies in a manner um, which is different from the qualifications for getting another element of that single benefit, and it does so in a way which disproportionately affects more women than men because of the nature of the people who claim that benefit, then you say that there is prima facie indirect discrimination and you have to justify it. Exactly. Because the benefit taken as a whole indirectly disadvantages women. So that aspect of your argument rests on the fact that there is an element within universal credit that requires, um, that doesn't require payment in advance for the service rendered. If housing benefit were taken out of the equation and there was no such application, that analysis wouldn't work, would it? Well, the way I put it wouldn't work. No. Whether it would still be possible to characterise that as indirectly discriminatory is another matter. Mm. It'd be much more difficult. I accept it would be more difficult. Yeah. But I, I don't. And also, if housing benefit existed outside the universal credit, then it benefit, wouldn't work. Then it wouldn't work. But doesn't that suggest that what we're dealing here with is whether the situations are substantively analogous, rather than with the. Uh, adventitious fact that they happen to have been packaged together under the label of a single benefit, albeit with different terms. Well, the, whole, the Secretary of State's whole point is that it's not just a labelling exercise. Well, that may be what the Secretary of State says, and that may be true in some perfectly legitimate political or administrative but sense, more, but, it, but, but, but we're dealing here with whether it is analogous yes. in the sense required by Article 14, and that can't be determined by the fact of how they have been labelled together by the that's I, that, that's I accept. It, it can't be determined on a labelling exercise. I absolutely accept that. But the whole thrust of the um, policy behind universal credit 
is that you need a single indivisible benefit in order to generate the work incentives. Because unless you have a single indivisible benefit which tapers as one, you lack that um, incentive. No, well, I see that too, but I still don't see why that provides the necessary basis of analogy between two balanced to what are nevertheless substantively two different kinds of benefit uh, with their own different rules attaching to them. Yes. Well, I think, I think that the, in my respectful submission, the mistake is to view them as two different benefits. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're part and parcel of the same benefit. All right, but where are you? Well, I, I'm accepting that for some purposes, but really you're simply saying that they are labelled together because they have certain... Um, all right, they're not labelled, they're packaged together because that way they can take advantage, I think, primarily of the taper and the cap. Uh, but I don't regard that as a complete answer as to whether they should be regarded as analogous. They're still aimed at different elements in people's need, which arise in different ways. But they, they are aimed at different, at different parts of people's needs, I accept that. But as I, uh, the answer I gave to my Lord, Lord Justice Warby, um, this morning, the, the 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 doctrine behind universal credit is to treat benefits as a means of getting into people, getting people into work, and treats people as you know, I mean, this isn't meant in a pejorative way. Treats people as units of production. And in that respect, the various things that human beings need to be functioning units of production. It doesn't really matter what all of the disparate parts are. They all pull in the same direction. help to have the references to the single integrated benefit or whether that's so apparent that uh, well you said it's the white paper I'm speaking for myself I, I think that's taken right. can, can I make a, a fifth and final point under this head which is that um, if one again I, I appreciate the standing back um, approach isn't always very attractive but this, can I just say this if one, if one stands back that the, the proof of payment rule makes it harder for women to use universal credit to get into work and make work pay. Harder than? Than for men to use universal credit to get into work and make work pay. Because they're not resulting in the same degree? Because men mm -hmm. have fewer childcare responsibilities. And is, this, is this a broad point about it's it's less likely that a, a working man is going to want the childcare element of universal credit? Is that the point? Yes, it is, but it's it's in support of the the point. I really a subsidiary of the point I've just made, yeah. which is that universal credit is a single integrated benefit, and once one views, if one looks at universal credit through the lens of one of its main aims of getting people into work. Universal credit taken as a whole makes it more difficult for women to get into work than it is for men to use universal credit to get into work. Men and women will need a package of measures to get into work. They will need money to pay for clothes and food and housing and pay for um, clothes and food and so on for their children. Some of them will also need childcare. to say about the judge's first approach. His second approach is 
little more straightforward. Women generally earn less than men, and it's therefore harder for women to pay for childcare up front. Sorry, you're, you're so um, well structured. I had to go back in my notes to find. Yes, OK, I'm with you now. Such a second approach. Women generally earn less than men, therefore harder for women to pay for childcare up front, yeah. so as to satisfy the proof of payment rule. And that, we respectively say, is akin to a paradigm example of a strength requirement to get a job. A slightly preferred strength requirement to the height requirement, because it's not so absolute. Mm. Women are, on average, less strong than men, so less able to satisfy a strength requirement. Whereas Ms. Dobbin could never reach six foot. She spends all week in the gym, she might be able to bench press the requisite amount, but it's just harder. So the judge relied on, in respect of this, the judge relied on official government statistics that 80% of childcare element claimants were women and undisputed evidence of median hourly earnings. 13 pounds for single men, eight pounds for women. He recognized that the median earnings related to the population as a whole, rather than specifically to universal credit claimants, but concluded that there was bound to be a significant difference in that cohort too. And as I read it, he concluded that it was self-evident that women would therefore generally find it harder to make upfront payments, viewed as a, as, a, as a group as a whole. And, and that, in our submission, is a perfectly legitimate approach. And can I show you authority for that? Um, if one looks at the case in um, Authority, Volume 1, Tab 25, of Adiasi in the divisional cause, and although it's only divisional cause, it's, it's, it's just summarising well-established principles, so I think I, I hope I can get away with it. <laughs> um, this was an a EU law challenge to the arrangements for statutory sick pay during the pandemic. And one of the complaints was that the minimum income threshold for statutory sick pay, which was £120 a week, indirectly discriminated against women because, on average, they earn less than men. Quite a similar situation. And if you could please look at page 848. Please read paragraph 151. And just to note, um, we don't rely on the detail, paragraphs 152 and 153, which come under the heading, the requirement that a person must earn um, the minimum income 
threshold in order to qualify for statutory sick pay. And one can see at 152 um, the statistics on women being lower earners structurally. And then 153, the defendant accepts that it's likely that a greater proportion of women than men earn below the lower uh, threshold. That's all I wanted to show you in Adi Arsic. Um, could we also please look at, I appreciate that's, that's obviously an a, um, EU law case. Could I now turn to an Article 14 case um, in Volume 2 of the authority? seminal indirect discrimination case DH against the Czech Republic. Roma children were disproportionately likely to be sent to special schools, giving rise to prima facie indirect race discrimination. If you could please turn to page 1196. As I recall this case, it was a, it was a practice rather than a rule or principle that led to this disproportionate population of Roma children in these special schools. It's slightly unusual in that sense. It was the government that was sending them there. Yes, well, it was one of those cases where it wasn't possible to identify the mechanism which led to the indirect discrimination. It was likely to have been something about the psychometric testing which led to children being channelled into special schools. But it was, it was impossible to put one's finger on what it was. It wasn't necessary. But it's not necessary. I'm so sorry, Mr Butler. Which page did you want to It was about? 1196, please. Thank you. And at paragraph 178, the court says, as regards to the question of what constitutes prima facie evidence capable of shifting the burden of proof onto the respondent's state, the court stated in the Chova that in proceedings before it, there are no procedural barriers to the admissibility of evidence or predetermined formulae for its assessment. The court adopts the conclusion that, that are, in its view, supported by the free evaluation of all evidence, including such inferences as may flow from the facts and the party's submission. According to the established case law, proof may follow from the coexistence of sufficiently strong, clear, and concordant inferences or of similar unrebutted presumptions of fact. So it's a very similar approach to the one that we just looked at in Adiati. And then, if we could please also look over Leaf. Paragraph 179, I'm just going to look at the first six lines. The court has also recognised that convention proceedings don't in all cases lend themselves. So, so which paragraph? Paragraph 179. The court has also recognised that convention proceedings don't in all cases lend themselves to a rigorous application of the principle of a incumbent probatio in certain circumstances where the events in issue lie wholly or in large part within the exclusive knowledge of the authorities, the burden of proof may be regarded as resting on the authorities to provide a satisfactory and convincing explanation. Of course, that's just a fancy way of saying um, we've got a situation in which a very large number of Roma children are ending up in special schools. It needs an explanation. Over to you, government, to do something about it. The, 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 the point I was um, referring to that for was that if the Secretary of State wanted to say there is something peculiar about um, the universal credit cohort which means one can't apply um, what is generally known about the earning disparities of women compared to men, then it would be appropriate to say, well, over to you, Secretary of State. It's not been said. It's not, the submission hasn't been made. No. Because that data is exclusively in the province of the Secretary of State. 
or is more readily available to the Secretary of State? Uh, there's final two passages, if, if I may. On, on the following page, 1198, paragraph 186, the court says, as mentioned above, the court has noted in previous cases that applicants may have difficulty in proving discriminatory treatment in order to guarantee those concerned the effective pre protection of their rights, less strict evidential rules should apply in cases of alleged indirect discrimination. And then finally, if I may overleaf, paragraph 188. In these circumstances, the court considers that when it comes to assessing the impact of a measure or practice on an individual or group, statistics which appear on critical examination to be reliable and significant will be sufficient to constitute the prima facie evidence the applicant is required to prove. This doesn't, however, mean that indirect discrimination can't be proved without statistical evidence. So I don't think I need to take time to turn it up, but that supports the view taken by the Court of Appeal in JCWI that Strasbourg takes a, takes a broad brush approach to evidence in indirect discrimination cases. And so we respectfully say in those circumstances that the Secretary of State's submission that there had to be some kind of incontrovertible statistical evidence, that's what I noted down from yesterday, that women were less able to pay childcare costs up front is, we respectfully say, wrong. Again, I, I'm not sure this is a question that displays a misunderstanding, but um, what we're talking about on this approach is a comparison between um, male and female claimants for the childcare component of the universal credit. Yes, we're only looking at that pool. So the starting the pool is to start with is people who have, have earnings at a level that means that they get some universal credit. Yes, although that's actually quite a wide bracket. Well, yes, and that's that's where um, where this question comes from, because it, it doesn't necessarily follow um, as a matter of logic that the um, disparity in uh, earnings in the general population would translate into a, an equal or even any disparity in income for those uh, receiving universal credit who, in court, of course, include a vast range of people, some of whom are in and some of whom are not in employment. My Lord, I had the same concern. Yes. Which is why we did the exercise of trying to work out what you could earn up to and still claim universal credit. And the, I haven't got, I can provide the detailed workings if you want them, I haven't got them at my fingertips, but you could be a single parent with two children and be earning up to around £62,000 before the taper ran out. So we're not talking about only those no. on the limits of survival. No. But, but that's, that's true, but why, why does that wide range Why are people who are claimants of universal credit, but within that wide range? Uh, why are there likely to be proportionately more men than women in that? In, that's, in, no, so that's not the submission. In the less disadvantaged. That's I'm not sorry, I'm missing the point. No, the, the point is that, um, generally speaking, across the entire population in the UK, structurally women earn less than men. Yes. And one, the, the inference drawn by the judge is that structurally, those claiming childcare element among that cohort, women are structurally likely to earn less than men. That's the inference he draws. Mm. And therefore, because they earn less, they're less able to satisfy the advance payment rule. Yes, but why, what I'm trying to get at, I expressed it badly, I may express it badly again, is why are those structural elements Why is it safe to apply that the, to, to infer that those structural elements apply equally in this highly specialised group? It, you could say, for example, that uh, the reason why structurally women earn uh, more than men is that at 
very high levels. High, very high levels, men are much better paid than women. Yeah, I accept that. In the, theoretically, you could say, if, if the Secretary of State said, well, I don't accept that the general pattern, the general structural disparity in earnings between men and women doesn't apply in the universal credit cohort, because, as my Lord posits, it's actually those who earn over £60,000 a year where the disparity lies, and it's only by averaging out those across the whole population that one leads to an average disparity. Isn't that was never suggested in this case? And it was a well, that all depends who the burden is on. Whether you've got to first base to call for an explanation. Well, it's in my respectful submission a perfectly fair inference for the judge to draw that there's no reason to suppose that the universal credit cohort is in a substantially different position from the entire population. And I would also note that, of course, there's quite a wide, there's quite a large buffer to play with. Yes, so your, your 62,000 is roughly twice the median earnings for the year in question. Yes, mm. but in terms of the buffer, I wasn't really referring to the no. 60,000 pounds. The buffer is because the average difference in median earnings is 13 pounds versus 8 pounds. It's a really, it's not as if we were saying structurally the median earnings are eight pounds for women and nine pounds for men, in which case um, translating the general picture to the universal credit picture um, might require more care. 13 versus eight. 13 versus eight. And if, if you, if the reference is um, paragraph 157 of the judgment. So you say that the judge was entitled um, to treat those people, male and female, who claim universal credit uh, as, if you like, a microcosm reflecting society as a whole in terms of the wage disparity. Yes. A, because there was nothing that suggested otherwise, and there could have been, and B, because it's a it's not a it's it's a it's a reasonable inference to draw. It's a, and it's a reasonable inf and, and, and bolstering the reasonable inference point are the size of the disparity across the general population. Yes. And the size of the universal credit cohort. We're not talking about a very small proportion no. of earners because of the sixty two thousand pound threshold. Of course, I'm not suggesting it's, it's not, a, but it's not actually even the whole of the universal credit cohort. It's that that part of the universal credit cohort who chain, claim the, the childcare care element. Yes. So of course, it would be it would be possible. I mean, I suppose one way I'm just thinking it is that one of the depressant features in um, women's earnings generally across society is the various indirect consequences of being the primary carer for children. Yet if a cohort we're looking at is people claiming childcare benefits, you'd expect those features to apply equally in the much less common case where it's the man who's the no, principal carer no, for children. No, because the median earnings that the judge looked at were single men with children rather than single women with children. Yes, I see. Yeah, that's important. Sorry, I should be. No, I should have that up. Sing, single mothers rather than single fathers. That's what he was comparing. Uh, single father with child, but single. Yes, okay. Single father. That means single fathers with with child care responsibilities. Yeah. Primary child care responsibilities. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and to be just to be clear, I think I think this was understood that the. £62,000 threshold from our example of single parent with two children, that, that applies only to those claiming the childcare element. That's what I'd read. Yes. There are so many variables, as, as is obvious. But um, am I right in thinking that the, or is this your submission, that the um, 
The method by which universal credit is calculated requires disclosure of um, the data from which you could suppose the Secretary of State would be able to produce the statistics. Well, exactly. That That's the po po point we made in our skeleton yeah. argument was that it, it, it doesn't comfortably lie in the Secretary of State's mouth to say, ah, you haven't gone far enough, your, your data is too general, when the data's in her hands. From the Universal Credit Cohort. From the Universal yeah. Credit Cohort. And so if, if we were wrong, if the inference were an, an unsafe one, well, it would be so easy for the Secretary of State. <laughs> to correct so easy to when it comes to data collection, but um, you'd rather... But well, that's, too high. That's, a, that's a rhetorical way of putting it. It, they have be, to know, it must they be possible know. because they have the data. It might have to write a special program quite easily. Yeah. Well, the, 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 um, you know, even in this course, the Secretary of State's point would have more traction if they produced um, post hoc evidence to show that this point actually wasn't. Um, the, the, the statistics relied on by the judge were actually unsafe or immaterial. Mm -hmm. No suggestion of that kind. No, the point that's taken against you is that there's enough. There's not enough hard evidence to found your your case. Not that the evidence that you seek to rely on is unreliable. No. So, so the the what I was attempting to knock down was by reference to the case law was the submission as I recorded it yesterday that you can't make out indirect discrimination without incontrovertible statistical evidence. Yeah. That's just wrong as a proposition of law. That, unless there are any questions arising in relation to the formulation of the indirect discrimination, those were my submissions on my third topic. So my fourth topic then is the test for justification under Article 14. I could ask you please to, to turn up the judgments below. Uh, at page 135. judge applied the manifestly without reasonable foundation standard, but based on the Court of Appeals judgments in SC and JCWI, held that the intensity of review depends on context. That's what he says at letter E on this page. Sorry, I, I was making that. What was the paragraph? It's paragraph E on page 135. It's, it's part of paragraph 167. And he then identifies three particular factors, contextual factors. At F, he identifies, number one, whether discrimination is on suspect grounds. Number two, whether and to what extent the matter involved a real socio-economic policy choice present in the mind of the decision maker. And number three, whether the measure had been approved by Parliament. Those are all context factors which went to margin of discretion. And then, if one please turns forward to well, the next page, page 136, He deals with the first factor, suspect grounds, at paragraph 169, and identifies that the claim, complaint relates to indirect sex discrimination. In relation to the second factor, he deals with that at paragraph 170, and identifies that there was no evidence of any consideration by ministers of the problems identified by stakeholders of the proof of payment rule or a proof of liability rule. 
And then in relation to the third factor, that's over leaf at page, oh, sorry, two pages over leaf. So page 138, paragraph 171, the third factor. He identifies that a greater margin of discretion is to be afforded in light of the rule being set out in subordinate legislation. So he properly identifies three contextual factors and then applies them to this case. Just give me a moment, but I just want to look at exactly how what he says at 169. Yeah, sorry, now I understand. Thank you. So he's saying setter is paradox. Not saying one always applies a convincing, weighty, convincing and weighty reasons test wherever there's an allegation of sex discrimination. He's saying more convincing and weighty reasons, reasons will be needed than if the discrimination on another non suspect ground, all other things being equal. And then he draws the threads together at page. Uh, 138, paragraph 172, and places particular weight on the lack of consideration of the issue by ministers. Now that's the area that's um, been the focus of much of the challenge on this appeal. Yes. Uh, on the basis that um, one can extrapolate from the case law that where a minister has directly directed his or her mind to a particular issue and made a, a, a specific value judgment as to which way to jump, then it's, if you like, a plus point in favour of leaving that decision well alone. Well, we respectfully right disagree with that analysis, my lady. I'm going to yeah. come on and deal with it. That is absolutely the right approach in relation to primary legislation. And the authority for that is SC. Yes. It's absolutely not the right approach to subordinate legislation. And the authority for that is Brewster. And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so that was his approach to margin of discretion. Applying that margin, he then conducts the substantive proportionality analysis. And in conducting the substantive analysis, in my submission, he had two critical considerations in mind. First, that the rule undermined a central aim of the scheme. And secondly, that a less intrusive measure could have been used without unacceptably compromising the achievement of the objective of Lim 3 Bank Mellon. As I understand it, the Secretary of State contends that the judge committed three errors in relation to justification. One, the scrutiny he applied was too strict. Two, it was impermissible to examine whether the decision maker had confronted the problem and considered solutions. One second. Yeah. And three, that he wasn't entitled to consider whether there was an alternative rule which would have resolved or ameliorated the problem. attempt to take those points in turn. So the, as to the first point, before the Supreme Court gave judgment in SC, there was, I accept, a respectable argument that the widest margin of discretion 
had to be afforded to the minister. And I say that because there was a tension between the Court of Appeals judgments in SC and JCWI on one hand, which indicate that intensity of review is context dependent, even in relation to welfare benefits. So the tension between that on the one hand and the Supreme Court's judgments in Humphreys and DA, which speak of manifestly without reasonable foundation as a monolithic test. Now, they don't use the term monolithic. That's my reading of it. The way that certainly DA was was read at one time was as ex excluding bank mallet. Um, so if it's within the field of socio-economic benefits, um, you don't go through the fourfold stage, but you look at it and say, um, is there any way in which this can be objectively justified, and, and only get involved with um, tinkering with it if if it can't. So, yes. That, Absolutely. And the, the way in which certainly DA was read yeah. was as doing two things. Firstly, in terms of the substantive test, it ousted Bank Mellor yes. and applied the single test. But also in terms of scrutiny, which is clearly distinct from yeah. the substantive test, it was saying there's only one. There's only one approach. Yeah. You, don't ha you don't vary with context. Because if it's a socioeconomic measure, it's manifestly without, without reasonable foundation. And that means only one thing. It was certainly read as a bright line test. Exactly, exactly. So, so, so I accept that before the Supreme Court's judgment in SC, there would have been a respectful argument open to the Secretary of State to say, well, look, there's a tension between these Court of Appeal judgments and these Supreme Court judgments, and the judge erred in applying the, the Court of Appeal approach. He was bound by the Supreme Court's approach. But, but I'm, I'm really setting that up to knock it down on the basis of the judgment of the seven justice Supreme Court in SC, which has, has resolved that tension. And what the Supreme Court has done is to approve the context dependent approach which the judge applied. If I may, I, it may or may not be helpful because I think clearly you're going to have to read <laughs> SC with some care anyway, but if I could just go through it and um, show you how, how we read it overall. It's in, in volume two, tab 31. And the, the long section on the test of justification begins at page 1078. So the, 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 the reason the court is grappling with this <coughs> is apparent from the heading two-thirds of the way down, 1078. It was because of the European Court's judgment in JDNA and subsequent cases in which the European Court said the Supreme Court's been getting it wrong in the UK. So it had to the Supreme Court, the time had come, this was the first time after JD where the Supreme Court considered the question of justification and it confronted this issue. And from paragraph 98 right through to paragraph 120, Lord Reed analyzes the European Court's approach up to and including step. So one could do a heading for 98 through to 120 European cases up to and including STEC. And then within that section, at paragraph 115 on page 1081, he identified some general features of those cases. So one, um, the court distinguishes between uh, different grounds for differences in treatment. Two, whether the measure is a socio-economic part of socio-economic strategy. Three, whether there are common standards among states. 
and four, whether the measure relates to the elimination of historic inequality, and five, he bunches together other factors. And then at paragraph 116, in respect of that series of European cases, he says, as the cases demonstrate, more than one of those points may be relevant in the circumstances of a particular case, and unless one factor is of overriding significance, it's then necessary for the court to make a balanced overall assessment. So that takes us up to an including Steg. And then at the bottom of page 1082, paragraph 121 begins later cases. And from paragraph um, 121... So I'm just, I'm just reminding myself, the very first sentence is, support that view. What is the view that it supports? I'm sorry, where's my Lord reading from? The Press very down. first sentence of 121, which I thought was where you were taking us to. Later cases where reference has been made to the manifesto without reason to support, support that view, yes. What is the view that the, it the, supports? The, the, the view um, that I think I've summarised... Um, well, it's 120, isn't it? The last sentence of 120, I think. It's the last sentence of 120. It, it, um, it, if there's a ground of def differential yes. treatment that would yes. be justified by weighty reasons, in other words, yes. one of the yeah. prohibited character, yes. other factors may be, yes. nevertheless make it appropriate to allow the state a wide, wide mar yes. margin of appreciation. Yes. Yeah. So, a classic example, primary legislation, yes. Yes. Well, where, where the minister is actually given active consideration. Yes, yeah, so the, the, the point that's been made at 120, I think, is broadly the same as the point made, made at 116, that yeah. you, you balance the factors. Yeah. And, 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 and yeah. in some cases, one factor will be of greater significance than <coughs> in, other, in another case. Uh, so, so, so 121, uh, one's dealing with uh, the period immediately after STEC uh, through to JD, JD against the UK. And then um, on page 1084, we get another taking stock paragraph, uh, paragraph 129. Up to this point, the case is from Steck onwards, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And essentially, the Lord Reed revisits the features that he's identified at paragraph 115. The same features present in that tranche of European cases. And in paragraph 130, he again says, it's a balancing exercise. The remaining point which could be drawn from the cases or up to this point is how the court has balanced different factors when they pull in different directions, notably where the need for very weighty reasons coexists with the generally wide margin of appreciation described by the manifestly without reasonable accommodation formulation. Well, as I read it, things haven't, don't change between STEC and JD in the UK, the same as up to and including STEC. And then over Leith, at paragraph 131, there's a heading, JD and A against the UK. And from, from here onwards, Lord Reed examines not only JD, but then the cases which follow it. And can I ask you to note that Paragraph 133, Lord Reed sets out part of the European Court's reasoning in JD. Um, and if one, you could please look at um, um, the, the cited paragraph 88. Halfway down that paragraph, there is a sentence which reads, thus, even a wide margin in the sphere of economic or social policy doesn't justify the ado adoption of laws or practices that would violate the prohibition of discrimination. Hence, in that context, the court has limited its acceptance to respect the legislature's policy choice as not manifestly without reason to foundation to circumstances where an alleged difference in treatment resulted from a transitional measure forming part of the scheme carried out in order to correct an inequality. So what the European Court is saying is you only apply the manifestly without reason for foundation threshold in discrimination cases if the measure is correcting historic inequality. It's a radical thing for the court to say in JD against the UK. And then paragraph... One moment, one moment um, 
Yes, was was uh, J D one was Thimenos discrimination, and the first discrimination was direct. First complaint was of direct discrimination, wasn't it? I can remember one was the sanctuary scheme, and the other was. Um, I may need to come back to that. Oh, sorry, I think I've, I've slightly misread one three two. There's one thing we'll be asking for your submissions on presently is um, how the suspect Brown's jurisprudence applies to cases of indirect discrimination. Yes. Well, the answer to that is that Lord Reed gave very clear answer. Yeah. So okay. But that, that's fine. I'm just I'm just bearing that in mind as we read through this. Yes. But yes. Keep going. Yeah. Can I, can I just finish on on um, yes, of JD? Course. So I I read part of paragraph 88, and then 89. That's underscored outside the context of transitional measures designed to correct historic inequalities, the court has held that given the need to prevent discrimination against people with disabilities and foster their full participation and integration in society, the margin of appreciation the states enjoy in establishing different legal treatment for people with disabilities is considerably reduced. So in effect, what they're saying is that the, the UK courts have misunderstood the circumstances in which manifestly without reasonable foundation applies in Article 14 cases. And then over leave, <coughs> at, a par at paragraph 135, um, Lord Reed says in the second sentence, I have to confess to some difficulty in understanding um, the third sentence of paragraph 88 that we just looked at. The court's case law doesn't support the statement that in the sphere of economic or social policy, the court has limited its acceptance to respect the legislative policy choices, not MWRF, the circumstances where an alleged difference in treatment resulted from a transitional measure. But then he says in the final sentence of paragraph 135 that the court in JD would have known that. So there's a bit of, I think what Lord Reed's saying is there's a bit of sleight of hand by the Strasbourg court in JD. They're changing their approach without saying so and providing cover on the basis that, well, we, this is the approach we've always taken. And then at paragraph 138, Lord Reed notes that the JD formulation was repeated by the European Court in a case called Jerkic. And then at paragraph 140, he notes that the JD formulation was again repeated in a case called Jucheva. And so. And yet in Jerkic, according to Para 138, the court reiterated the manifestly without reasonable foundation standard which you wouldn't expect it to have done if there'd been this sort of seismic change in JS. JD, sorry. I'm sorry, my lady. The, the, I mean, the, the, the passage that's cited at 138 yeah. uh, uh, it, it appears to be on all fours with JD. Well, what, what Lord Reed is saying is that in Jurchich, the court reiterated the manifestly without reasonable foundation standard. And yet, JD seemed to suggest that it was only to be applied in cases involving transitional measures. Yes, but then went on to give the following. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know what the facts of Jerchich were, but they, right. it goes on to then deal with um, what the test is in our, in, in our context. The court has also stressed on many occasions the advancement of the equality of the sex is a major goal. This means that outside the context of transitional measures designed to correct historic inequalities, very weighty reasons would have to be advanced. So it's not, it, it's, not, it's, it's, saying, it's not saying that manifestly without reasonable foundation applies anywhere other than transitional measures to correct historic inequalities. Well, it's a very different formula. Very weighty reasons rather than limited to uh, transitional measures. I mean, yeah. out, outside, yes, so, so, the, outside so, so, the context of tra transitional measures, it is contemplated that there could be justification for a difference in treatment in that sense. Sorry, the second sentence of that citation reads, yeah. 
outside that context, very weighty reasons would have to be advanced. Yes, but that's quite different from the sentence in, um, quoted by Lord Reed in paragraph 135, mm. that the court has limited its acceptance of yes. rejecting the legislative to its voluntary choice to circumstances where a alleged difference in treatment resulted from a transitional me measure. That's saying that's the only circumstance. Whereas uh, I think the point that, that uh, Lord Reed is himself making was that the passage in Kurichik, if that's the right pronunciation, um, was, uh, was consistent with the case law prior to JD. I, 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 I have to confess, I don't, I don't read it that way at all. Um, I see that... that what well, that's the point he made in 139. This reasoning is broadly in line with the court's case law prior to, prior to JD. Yeah. Go on. It, it's, it's a complex, um, I was going to say, precedential picture, but it's not precedent, of course, in the same sense that we understand no. it. Well, I, I, as I read it, and I may be completely wrong, um, what Lord Reed is saying is if you look at JD on the face of it, it appears to be confining. Uh, a manifestly without reasonable foundation approach to transitional measures which is designed to deal with historic inequality. But then you look at the case law since that, and yes. it's not going that far. Yes. Um, the court is not going that far, but it is nevertheless stressing that in cases where you are dealing with um, uh, one of the prohibited grounds for discrimination, yes. there, then you've got to show very weighty reasons for, uh, for, for just, justification. Yes. Yes. Uh, whereas, if you read on, yes. um, uh, it, it may be that if there's a, a differentiation on non-suspect grounds, you simply uh, stand back and afford a wider <coughs> margin of discrimination. Yes, uh, I'm uh, so sorry. Discretion. That's quite right. And I, I absolutely agree, my lord. I wasn't expressing myself very well, but I think we're all on the same page. Yes, we are. <laughs> we are. Uh, 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 and then broadly the same effect in uh, in Uchiva at paragraph 140. But um, it, 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 in some ways, one doesn't need to understand um, the... Um, route by which one gets to the result, one only needs to look at the result. Um, and the result is paragraph 142. End of line three. It's not that there's no mechanical rule. It's all a matter of balance. And your overall submission is that that, um, that and the, and the su subsequent passages of this judgment are consistent with the way that the judge approached. Yeah, yeah, they've indicated the, the judge's approach, which was, I accept, <coughs> <laughs> might be thought to have been slightly risky at the time. Uh, and then what one gets from paragraph 143 onwards is Lord Reed turning to the approach of the domestic court. <coughs> and at paragraph uh, from paragraph 149, over Leith, he deals with Humphreys, and he notes that it applied a test of manifestly without reasonable foundation. And then at paragraph 151, Lord Reed diplomatically finds that the test was wrongly expressed in Humphreys. So in the second line of 151, he says, first, it seems to me that the manifestly without reasonable foundation formulation as used in the Strasbourg judgment doesn't express a test in the sense of a requirement whose satisfaction or non-satisfaction will in itself necessarily be determined of the outcome phrase indicates the width of the margin of appreciation, and hence the intensity of review, which is in principle appropriate in the field of welfare benefits, other things being equal. And then final three lines, however it's put, the question is more complex than a test, which was the language used in Humphreys, of whether the policy choice is manifestly without reasonable foundation, it might appear to be that were regarded as the entirety of the inquiry. And then the second point, paragraph 152, if one looks four lines down, 
as explained in the paragraphs above, differential treatment on a suspect ground, if it's capable of justification at all, generally but not always requires to be justified by very weighty reasons. That's so even in the context of measures of social and economic policy, which would usually benefit from the manifestly without reasonable foundation approach. The manifestly without reasonable foundation approach doesn't therefore replace or supersede the requirement for very weighty reasons where suspect grounds are an issue. Instead, the degree of deference usually appropriate in relation to socio-economic policy choices may have to be taken into account in assessing whether very weighty reasons have been shown. Paragraph 155, the court notes that in MA, the Supreme Court had um, upheld the Humphreys approach, which has been politely disapproved in the paragraphs above. And then paragraph 156, in DA, the court had also ad adhered to the manifestly without reasonable foundation test in particularly strict terms. And the citation reads, in relation to the government's need to justify what would otherwise be a discriminatory effect of a rule governing entitlement to welfare benefits, the sole question is whether it's manifestly without reason for foundation. Let there be no future doubt about it. And then over Leith, at page 1090, we get Lord Reed's conclusions. And um, <coughs> can you please read or reread? Paragraphs 157 and 158. Well, 158 and 159 are the heart of it, aren't they? Yes. Really. And then 160. Um, it may also be helpful to observe that the phrase manifestly without reasonable foundation as used by the European Court is merely a way of describing a wide margin of appreciation. It's got nothing to do with the substantive test. And then 161, one simply assesses proportionality in the ordinary way, giving appropriate weight to the judgment of the primary decision maker as the context demands. I just emphasise those words at the end of line three of 161. The ordinary approach to proportionality gives appropriate weight to the judgment of the primary decision maker. It's that judgment which may be worthy of respect on the basis of the decision maker's democratic legitimacy or and or institutional expertise. That's, that's the reason for margin, margin of appreciation. But as I'll show you in a moment by reference to Brewster, there's far less and possibly no basis for deferring to the decision maker if he or she didn't consider the issue before the court. There's nothing to defer to. I'll, make, I'll, I'll attempt to make that good in a moment by reference to Brewster. Are you going to address this on paragraph 162, um, which Ms. Dobbin relied on, particularly the second half? Yes, there's, it's, it's important for both the courts and for, uh, well, it's important for the courts and the executive and Parliament to recognise their, rele their, their, their relevant constitutional sphere. Absolutely. And I'm going to, in due course, come on to, the, to deal with the position of um, 
the way in which one respects the separation of powers in primary legislation, when reviewing primary legislation, and contrast it to the position when one's reviewing subordinate legislation. Uh, we'll rise for a few minutes. Interrupted your flow. Could I pick up the, um, the question that was put by my Lord and um, Vice President in relation to paragraph 162? Yes. What, what 
agree to say, particularly the last um, three lines of 162 before the citation, is that such cases present a risk of undue in interference by the courts in the sphere of political choices. That risk can only be avoided if the courts apply the principle in a manner which respects boundaries between legality and the political process. Now, the, 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 that, that absolutely, in my submission, goes hand in hand with the point I was just making which is that the reason that the courts give a degree of um, uh, discretion to um, the executive and a fortiori parliament is because it's the executive which bears the constitutional responsibility of making political choices and is accountable for those political choices, not in the courts, but the ballot box. And also, perhaps as a subsidiary point, because the executive, in certain um, matters of um, socio-economic judgment, has a particular expertise. The Department of Work and Pensions knows better than the courts how to administer social welfare benefits. But those two principles behind the um, margin of uh, deference, or how one whatever one calls it, only apply where there has been a genuine political choice. Wow. They only apply where there has been a judgment by the primary decision maker. I can see the danger that that proposition taken too far could create all sorts of unfortunate results. Because to take an extreme, you, you, you could take an extreme example by saying, well, because um, a consequence of a piece of secondary legislation which was thought through, went through the um, affirmative resolution procedure or even the other alternative um, uh, and uh, was put before the minister with lots of um, detailed um, input from his civil servants or her civil servants over a period of time but unfortunately there was one wrinkle which was overlooked it, something, it was an unforeseen consequence um, uh, and it turned out that it disadvantaged, let's say, women or dis disabled people in a particular way, um, that the court would be more uh, able to interfere with that because it was overlooked than they would if it was specifically looked at and examined and considered by the minister, um, which is rather sort of a council of perfection, isn't it? Because the minister can't possibly apply his or her mind to absolutely every potential permutation of the legislation that is in contemplation. But, but can I make two, two, two things clear about my position? The first is that the court still needs to conclude that it's substantively disproportionate, and the court will still admit post hoc evidence. Yeah. So the, the decision maker isn't stuck with having not considered it, it at the time. If, for example, someone in Ms. Parker's position puts forward perfectly good justification for the measure after the event. But the, it is the logical consequence of the minister not turning his or her mind to the relevant issue that one can't give deference on the basis of democratic accountability or institutional expertise, because no democratic accountability has been exercised well, in respect to that isn't matter. This a, isn't this attributing democratic legitimacy only to things that have passed the eye of the minister? You would say, ultimately, the brain of the minister, yes. but you can't ever prove yes. that. Uh, but surely the minister is responsible for a process. He's responsible for his or her department. Yes. Uh, and uh, it might be thought to be artificial and unrealistic to exclude from any element of deference matters which were hotly debated among the civil servants, fully consulted about by them with the stakeholders, or which are not, some aspect of which was not demonstrably in any document that went into the minister's red box. Well, that was certainly because the process, the process is part 
the, 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 the civil service process is part of um, uh, democratic le legitimacy. Well, only, uh, even only, though you don't vote for your civil servants. Only if it feeds into the political process. Well, it, uh, not in an but it does feed into the political, or feeds into the executive process, well, of which a minister who is politically elected, who is democratically elected, actually in this particular case not, but is part of our, nevertheless, of our democratic institutions, um, is responsible. Well, and that, they're yeah. answerable to Parliament if they get it wrong, and they're answerable to Parliament if... Uh, they get it wrong because a particular point uh, was thought about by uh, civil servants, but not actually thought about by them. Yes. Well, if if it, if it feeds in the political judgment, then yes, it attracts deference on account of political accountability. But on my lord's example, it would certainly attract deference on account of institutional expertise. If it was considered by the expert civil servant. Well, we know that it was. Well, yes, and one knows what they said about it, which... Um, we were saying that as if what they said about it was obviously wrong. Well, the, um, I have to go back to it, but they didn't, they didn't seek to justify it in the way that um, it's been um, advanced in this course. It was about um, reconciliation. I mean, is this point... Um, more nuanced because what you're dealing with is not so much a field of policy as to whether somebody should get a particular benefit or what the threshold should be or um, but rather about the mechanism by which one claims it well I know to come on to make the submission yes. due course by reference to Langford there is clearly a distinction between aims and means mm. and high policy aims are clearly in a different category when it comes to deference, and the mechanism chosen, the rules chosen to give effect to the aims. Yes. Of course, it's a sliding scale mm. because even rules may contain difficult political choices, or have underlying them difficult political choices. So the the sort of measure that one was dealing with in SC, for example, which was a, which was clearly a political decision in terms of the cap with certain aims that were behind it is, is of a different nature. It is of a different nature, but interestingly, and I'll show you in a moment, the court still applies the detritio standard scrutiny. Yes. But, but uh, this is, a, I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting debate, if I may say so, but I don't need to go nearly so far as I've just done in this discussion. All I have to do is demonstrate that the judge was entitled to have regard to whether or not the minister considered the matter when deciding on how to strike the balance on degree of deference. And just remind me of the factual basis of all that. The key memo that we were shown yesterday, in which the judge quotes, in which this problem is adverted to, and an answer given, saying not the same answer as being adverted now, but still, the point is clearly addressed, is the point that uh, there is no evidence, specifically as Palmer does not say, that that particular document ever passed the minister's desk. Exactly. So there is, there is, there he is. He doesn't one. say it didn't. No. There is, there is, but by implication, because we know what passed the minister's desk. Well, do we? Well, we we can see from the briefing notes what the minister is told. We've got a complete set of briefing. Yes, but are the briefing notes the only papers the minister ever sees? Well, it's difficult for me to say. But, um, well, no, it's simple for us. Well, yes, I see that. But I mean, you're saying that we can infer that he didn't see this because we know he did see the briefing notes. But that seems to me to be well, a dangerous the, inference. The, 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 actually, the, the, respectfully, so the task for this court is to ask whether the judge fell into error. Well, I dare say, but um, in you can fall back on that. But at the moment, I just want to, if I were the judge, um, I would think it. I, I would think it important to your submission to be able to invite him to say that the, to, on the balance of probabilities or the balance of the evidence, the judge never saw this document. Sorry, the minister never saw this document. Yes. And I'm not quite clear 
on what basis one can say that, except that Ms. Palmer doesn't say he did. Well, what one, what one sees if one works through the sequence, which is conveniently summarised by the judge, is that there was a meeting between civil servants and stakeholders, at which we know ministers weren't present. And it was the minutes of that meeting record, the, the concern being raised, and the answer given by the civil servants, which was the reconciliation point. Yeah. One then has a briefing note to the minister, which briefs the minister on that meeting. And doesn't mention it. And doesn't mention it. So it's not as if there might have been another briefing note which referred to that meeting and did mention it. We've got the briefing note that deals with that point, and it says nothing about it. So it's a pretty and what we don't have is any evidence of the type that one sees in Equality Act cases of the senior civil servant responsible for this area of policy saying, um, I know it's not on the document, but I went to see the minister afterwards in order to chat to him or her about this particular um, meeting that we had. And in the course of our conversation, I distinctly recall um, that I said, and by the way, somebody worried about this particular point, and we this is what we said about it. Exactly. So you, you don't have um, specific factual evidence to plug that evidential gap, you say. No, exactly. But one, and one also has pretty concrete evidence on which to draw the inference that the minister's attention wasn't drawn to this point because we've got the document that deals with that meeting. Yeah, no, well, uh, uh, that's, that's very helpful. Um, so you say it's it's a, a, as a matter of fact, the judge was entitled to make the finding that he did because there was a sufficient evidential basis for the finding that he made. That's a completely separate question from the legal question of whether or not it was something the judge was entitled to take into account in the first place. That's absolutely the way I would seek to put it. Yeah. Before I forget, could I just answer the question that my Lord asked about JD? Um, it, it had two parts to it. One was a Limenos challenge um, on behalf of the disabled claimant. And then there was an, also an ordinary indirect discrimination claim on behalf so, of the So, So it was, JD was in fact an indirect discrimination case. Exactly. Part. exactly. Mm -hmm. can, can I then, can I then um, carry on with um, SC? ask you please to look at page 1096. I'm going to come back and look at the question of parliamentary materials, which is the pages I'm skipping over. Yes. So 1096, bottom of the page, 180, paragraph 189, the court's already been taken to this, where Lord Reed notes that the US Supreme Court takes a different approach to scrutiny in direct discrimination cases to that which it takes in indirect discrimination cases. And Lord Reed says, third line from the end, there seems to me to be force in that observation, particularly in view of the wide scope of Article 14, but I'll follow the approach adopted by the European Court in Detrisa. No, I mean, the, I agree, he doesn't say this, but the flavour of that is um, for the purpose of this case, I will, or without deciding the point, I will. That, that, that's, I think, a fair observation. But when, when, it, comes, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it comes to this court's approach, in my respectful submission, this court ought to follow the clear and consistent line of European case law and not be swayed by the approach of the US Supreme Court. If the well, Supreme but it's, it's, it's confusing. You say a clear and consistent line, Di Trizio is not a particularly well-structured or easily to follow no. piece of reasoning. Um, it's the only case I'm aware of, but you may be about to tell us more, in which uh, the um, weighty reasons, uh, observations are made in the context of an indirect discrimination case. Well, we've looked at JD. That's another one. Was the all right? No, okay, that's fine. Um, 
and they're in the, they're the two Lord Reed doesn't seem to have regarded it as important from that point of view but it may be we might have to look at exactly what he said about it but let me just get to my, my yes. point we have strong observations perhaps you're about to come to this from uh, AM Somalia by uh, I think um, Mr. Dobbin said it was um, Lord Justice Maurice Kay in fact it was Lord Justice Elias um, uh, to the effect that indirect discrimination cases are different and one can see why they might be and Lord Reed saw, saw why they might be given that we only have to have regard or take into account the I forget what the correct phrase is the jurisprudence of the Strasbourg Court I'm not at the moment persuaded that it is not open to us to follow Lord Justice Elias and the um, uh, preliminary or provisional views of uh, Lord Reed as against what one might be able to infer from Tripsio. Well, what, what, what the, the ratio of the judgment in SC is everything the courts have said previously about manifestly without reasonable foundation would be put to one side. And what you do is you take a balanced approach where you weigh up the different factors. And the different factors are you attach, you give less deference, all other things being equal, where the ground of discrimination um, uh, is sex, uh, you um, uh, uh, give a wider margin, all other things being equal, where it's socioeconomic policy choice, and there are a number of other factors which come into play, but the court has to strike a balance. Now this court has to ask itself, did Mr Justice Chamberlain fall into error when determining how he balanced up the competing considerations. I promise not to lose sight of that point, Mr. Butler, but let's just assume for the moment that um, we were deciding this at the first right. the, the first instance. Where uh, The trend of what you seem to be saying was that you could sort of strike a halfway house, that it, you could take, into, well, although you still uh, take into account that this was discrimination on the sub on the suspect ground you could also take into account that it was uh, only indirect discrimination on the suspect ground is that what you were well, wait, sorry the the, 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 the the problem I have with the last proposition is in the brave new world post SC where one swept away all of the previous approach to manifestly without reason foundation where's the authority to say you take a different approach to indirect because nothing in any of the Strasbourg case law are summarized by but well, you don't need authority. You don't that. need authority. It, it, it strikes most people. It struck Lord Justice Elias. It struck Lord Reed and, strike, and the US Supreme Court. And it strikes me as a highly relevant, not decisive consideration, but a relevant consideration that the discrimination you are attempting to justify is indirect rather than direct. And I don't care if there's no authority that has actually said that, although. Um, that apparently the US Supreme Court has and uh, so if there's no European uh, uh, case law that said that um, are you saying that that's not a proper approach to take because of it's contrary to the Strasbourg case law yes I am and I would say it's a matter best left to the Supreme Court to decide whether we are going to take a new path in relation to indirect discrimination. But, but one doesn't need to decide that point in this case. Yeah. <coughs> because there are no reasons. Is, what, what, why does one not need? Because the judge took into account the very weighty reasons factor. Why do we not need to decide whether he was um, wrong in principle on that? Well, it, sorry, if, 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 if the court is suggesting that if the proposition being put is that the very weighty reasons factor doesn't apply in the indirect discrimination context, well, that is directly contrary to a consistent line of European authority. Well, you say that. So far, you've only shown us de Trizio. You've told us that's also contrary to JD, and I dare say you're right, but we haven't actually seen it. 
My Lord, if we go back to the passages that I took you to in SC, what my Lord Reed has done is he looks at up to and including SPEC and then between SPEC and JD and then JD onward. The three cases, JD, Yerkich, and Yechiva, all apply all other things being equal, strict scrutiny in indirect discrimination. Okay, so yeah, it's difficult for me, not having looked at all these cases as thoroughly as you have, to bear, you're saying both, not only JD, but also, what was it, Yerkich? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can take that from the citation from Yerkich at 138. And then Yechiva, we can see from the penultimate sentence of 140 that it repeats the second and third sentences of JD. It's actually quite difficult because you've got... The Supreme Court's left us with a balancing exercise. A balancing exercise suggests that if it's in a margin of socioeconomic... in an area of socioeconomic policy, you would normally give a wide margin of deference to the decision maker. You then say, well, there isn't a decision maker in the sense that anybody actively uh, applied their minds to this. Um, so that's not a, a justification for taking that rule. And then you've got to balance it against the fact that you no longer have a tick box exercise for manifestly without reasonable foundation. Um, but that's simply a a paraphrase, according to Lord Reed, of the wide margin of discord, or the width of the margin of discord. Uh, uh, Describe uh, the same thing. I, I mean, the, the, the trouble with all of this, it seems to me, is that once you get rid of a bright line rule, there's a danger of inconsistent application of uh, the, the measure of scrutiny to different, by different judges in different context, in, in the same context. Well, so you might have one judge who says, well, um, it may well be that it was a different judge from Mr Justice Chamberlain that he or she would have weighed up the same three factors in a slightly different way and come up with a different result. Yes. A matter for the judgment of the court. It's not terribly satisfactory when you're charging, with, uh, when you're looking at the lawfulness of a piece of subordinate legislation. Well, one could say that about the substantive proportionality test too. One judge might evaluate the matter differently to another. I mean, that's the whole point. Of yes, but I mean, with a sub substantive proportionality test, either it's proportionate or it's not. And so there's room for disagreement with that value judgment. But, but, but I'm so, what, what I find have difficulty with is why, isn't, what, why is it unobjectionable for there to be a value judgment in the proportionality assessment whereby one judge can properly form a different view as to the Article 14 compliance of a measure to another judge? But not but for it to be objectionable for one judge to take strike the balance slightly differently in the margin of discretion. And the whole point, the whole premise of the Greater Manchester Police case is that the, the, the appeal court might completely disagree with the uh, proportionality balance struck by the first instance judge. So it's it's it, the premise of the decision is that different judges will reach different conclusions on proportionality. Well, but the the actual rowing back in the uh, Manchester Police case from what was said in the previous case um, uh, is actually quite important mm. because effectively it says only you shouldn't um, uh, intervene unless you think it was wrong. In the sense Which you were very familiar with. In the sense of being an error in reasoning. Well, it's a little bit more sophisticated, it's a bit more elaborate um, uh, than that, but uh, it does effectively allow the appellate court quite a wide margin of review, the Manchester Police case, whereas you need know, nothing like, like um, Evans and Bartman or mm. um, uh, well, Wednesday. Don't have to say it would reverse. No, but the court, if, if, if this court um, concludes merely that it would have struck a different balance on the margin of discretion, or that it would have a, struck a different balance on the substantive question of proportionality, 
that is no basis for striking down the judges. Well, these are very familiar points. Uh, that you, but, but, you, can't, but, but, you can't put them into words any more no, than they have been or not no, already. No, I can't improve on, on, on the way it's put in that judgment, but I, I was attempting to respond to my lady's question, mm. which is, is it objectionable in principle for different judges to have different views on the same set of facts? as to the appropriate margin of discretion. The point on the I mean, yes, I, it wasn't quite so much that. It, it was just that the I, I was articulating the difficulty with jettisoning a bright line test in favour of this sort of multifaceted balancing exercise for the fact for the, for the simple reason that you're, you're likely to promote uncertainty. Um, well, I, I but that, so. that may well be the, the where we've got to, because of a result, uh, as a result of the way that we've been left with SC. Yes. So, what what do we do about AM Somalia? It's a decision of the Court of Appeal, binding on us unless it's been overruled by the Supreme Court. Could I? I think we're going to go over to it tomorrow anyway. Could I, could I try and address that question tomorrow? Yes. Um, I'll. When you do, can you just remind me uh, at one minor point that's been bugging me about the implications of all this. Is, is, is age a suspect reason? I'd better check that overnight too. <coughs> because, <coughs> see, I think it uh, uh, you know the point, which it comes up in other, in other discrimination cases. Uh, most suspect reasons are, are binary. Um, age isn't, and almost any measure of social policy will, if you choose your age group carefully, disproportionately impact one rather than another. And a message which arguably comes out of SC is that this is all about intensity of review, many factors feed into it, yes. there's no, you shouldn't apply bright line labels. But if that is so, it was inconsistent with that to say there should still be a bright line label around um, uh, any form of discrimination, and you can't make any distinction between one form of discrimination and another. Yes. Yes. Well, um, it may not be the end of the it, world it, for you. No, I don't think it is the end of the world for me. If, if I'm wrong, I mean, I was, I'm trying to give a. Um, no, you're being a, extremely a, helpful. A, a coherent answer so. to the question, and my, my submission is my submission based on the authorities subject to AM Somalia, which I need to deal with tomorrow, is that it would be contrary to a clear and consistent line. Of European cases yeah. to draw a distinction between no. uh, direct and indirect sex discrimination. But oh, sorry, sorry, can I just finish, finish, finish the answer to my Lord's point, which is that um, it, if I'm wrong about that, and that's simply a, another factor which could potentially go into the mix, well, then so be it. But it's, it was never suggested below to Mr. Justice Chamberlain by the Secretary of State that that was a factor which he ought to take into account. And um, the fact that he hasn't expressly referred to this being an indirect sex discrimination case rather than a direct discrimination case is no, in my submission, is not a, wouldn't be a proper basis for condemning um, the balance he struck on margin of discretion. When you come back to this, will you also just, at that point, give us a note of, and if, if it helps you to, show us the passages in the, uh, the, in the a consistent line of Strasbourg authority. De Trixio we've seen, but we haven't seen JD or Jurchich, except as um, summarised here, um, as summarised by Lord Reed. Uh, so if they say anything that makes it absolutely clear that it makes no difference, that it's indirect rather than direct, I think you ought to show us that. Okay. Um, could I just put a final point on that? Because I, I accept what my lord says about um, paragraph 189 of SC. But if there was a proper basis for distinguishing between direct and indirect discrimination on the basis of the cases as they stood, it's a bit surprising that Lord Reed didn't confront the issue. Well, having seen how comprehensive he was about everything you might say, he would have thought of everything. But actually, um, uh, 
I think even with him and even with this judgment, that's that's unsafe. After all, you might say, why does he only refer to de Trixio if the answer is in JD? Which is a more authoritative. Uh, de Trixio is only a decision, it's not a decision of the Grand Chamber. But this is the, you know, this is, you know, this, this, is, is, this, is this is the magnus opus on the question. We are not, you won't find us um, uh, questioning uh, anything that's clearly decided by this magnus opus. We'd be mad that we would be able to. No. But there are, with any big case, there are points that still need to be worked through in the aftermath, which yeah. may be one of them. Um, could I, my final point, I think, on SC ask you please to look at 1098. At paragraph 199, which is the, the, the ultimate conclusion on uh, indirect sex discrimination. And what Lord Reed says is once it's understood that the legitimate aims of the measure couldn't be achieved without the disproportionate impact on women arising from the demographic fact that they form the majority of parents bringing up children, the only remaining question could be asked in relation to proportionality is whether the inevitable impact on women outweighs the importance of achieving the aims pursued. So that's, what where, that's when you say we're, we're into the territory of the third um, of the bank mallet principles because that, that certainly lends some sort of comfort to the proposition that you still look to see whether the um, measure could have been could, could have been uh, sorry the aim could have been achieved by a less in um, discriminatory measure. Exactly. What what is I would ask rhetorically, what's Lord Reed doing there? Yeah. Other than to apply, uh, other than applying, Bank Mellet Lim three, mm. concluding that it, it can't be applied because there's no alternative, no. and then turning to Bank Mellet Lim four. So although he doesn't specifically mention Bank Mallet, that's effectively what he's doing. Exactly. Uh, if, if, I mean, he doesn't, does he? I mean, he hasn't, he doesn't, I think, mention Bank Mallet anywhere, does he? No, he doesn't. Mm. But he refers to the standard test, the standard approach to proportionality, which um, I, I would respectfully submit we all know is Bank Mallet. Mm. That's mm. paragraph 161. Yes, he does it twice in that paragraph, once in line three. And once in three lines from the end. Yes, and indeed the, the, the case, the Court of Appeal case that he refers to, JCWI, in paragraph 161, Lord Justice Higginbottom expressly sets out the four bank mallet tests questions. Yeah. So, um, having taken a little longer than I intended on SC, uh, we you respect shouldn't, you shouldn't apologise for that. It's, um, it's the, it's the most important case, I think, for us. Yes. But where, where, where I submit that takes us is that the first criticism of the judge, which I think I need to remind myself what the first criticism was so long ago. Um, if we get there first. Well, yeah, simply the way I put it. Screw the too strict. Too strict. Yes. Yeah. The, the, the first criticism the judge is we respectfully say misplaced. He, he was entitled to reach a balanced, context sensitive view of the appropriate margin of discretion. We respectfully say it can't be said that the balance he struck is an unreasonable one. Strasbourg line of authority and whether yeah, uh, thank you. other things being equal, strict scrutiny applies. So can I then turn to the second criticism, that it was impermissible to consider whether the decision maker had confronted the issue. Can I make it clear that at the moment that I'm dealing with that factor in relation to standard of scrutiny? And so to, to pick up on the um, point I've already made, the, the, the position in relation to primary legislation is, we respectfully say, as described by my lady, no adverse conclusions are drawn from any lack of evidence of consideration. But you might get extra insulation by demonstrating active consideration. 
who in my submission the position is categorically different in relation to subordinate legislation. On the position on primary legislation, can I, can I go back, please, to SC? Um, because it's also dealt with here. Um, it's page 1091. And there's a heading just beneath the first hole punch, the use of parliamentary materials. Yeah. I mean, the main focus of this is Article 9, isn't it? Exactly. It's, it's a little bit more than that, but it is, the, I think, the primary focus. Um, and, and one sees from the first sentence that the court is looking at primary legislation. And then I'm, I'm going to um, identify uh, what we say are four reasons as to why one doesn't try to discern Parliament's reasoning other than by looking at the face of the legislation. And the first reason is set out at paragraph 165. In short, the court would trespass on parliamentary privilege if it reviewed proceedings in Parliament. second point is a paragraph 166. The views of the, this is my paraphrase, the views of the executive for advancing a bill, views of the executive for advancing a bill, can't be assumed to be the reasons of parliament. The two are constitutionally distinct. third reason I get from paragraph 167, that Parliament doesn't give a corporate statement of reasons. <clears throat> its will finds expression solely in the legislative text. And then the fourth reason, paragraphs 168 and 169, Parliament's decisions aren't necessarily capable of being rationalised, given that they're the product of political negotiation. say that none of those considerations apply to subordinate legislation. The minister, not parliament, is the author of the instrument. Parliament can't amend the instrument. The reasons for the instrument for the ministers and as my lady has pointed out in argument those reasons can be identified through the evidence from the ministers officials exhibiting such records as may exist of the ministers reasoning. Now the, the position, the approach that the court should take 
in relation to subordinate legislation. It is in my submission the, the subject of binding authority, and that's Brewster. And that's in the first volume of authorities. This was a challenge to a rule in subordinate legislation concerning a public sector pension scheme. And I'm afraid there are two chunks of text I'd invite the court to read. The first is at page 491. If you would please read paragraph 50 to 52, to the end of 52. syndrome. I haven't marked it, but I thought, uh, didn't Miss Dobbin not take us to this yesterday? Maybe she didn't. No, she, she no, referred no, to no. it, but didn't take us to it. Passages have been cited in the government. In the skeleton. Perhaps that's what I was thinking. Uh, and, 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 I, and in other authorities that we looked at. Yes, yes. Or maybe these maybe words, did. certainly in paragraph 50, we've seen. Yep. Yes. But you, you, oh, yes, you've got Belfast against misbehaving from another authority. Well, no, I think, I think Lord Kerr's um, observations about the different hue right. we've seen elsewhere, yeah. possibly in that suite. It doesn't matter anyway. If, um, uh, uh, it, as you say, it's very familiar. Uh, 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 and then um, the next passage is page 495. If you please read paragraph 64 and 65. Yes, his reference is to decision by a government department, not being addressed by the government department responsible. Yes, but the, the, we're talking, Brewster is about subordinate legislation, and somebody must have signed off the subordinate legislation. I mean, I have to go back to it to see whether it was formally signed by the minister or a senior civil servant. I, I would have thought it would have to have, to have been the minister. says um, at paragraph 2 the second respondent the Department of Environment for Northern Ireland made and uh, was responsible for the 2009 regulations but unless well, that may be there's something thing. peculiar about Northern Ireland well, that's what I wonder well, that's a bit of work for the juniors every night isn't it? yeah and so in light of that um, and then come to the judges, Mr Justice Chamberlain's findings, he found that ministers didn't give any thought to whether to base entitlement on liability to pay or proof of payment. Mm -hmm. That's his judgment, paragraph 173G. And then in relation to 
173G. And in relation to post hoc evidence, which might still attract some weight, no evidence was presented to the judge which explained why the rule had to be a proof of payment rule rather than the proof of liability rule. That was recorded at paragraph 173J. Assuming the judge was entitled to make those findings on the material and the submissions made to him, we say that, that his approach of having regard to that factor in relation to the um, margin of appreciation, margin of deference, is unimpeachable. So that's um, what I was going to say about uh, approach to margin of deference. C can I then deal with the substantive assessment of proportionality? And as I think I've already submitted, now that it's been recognised that manifestly without reasonable foundation relates to the Sorry, is this your third of the alleged errors? I'm, I'm, about, to, I'm about to launch into my third. I'm, I'm taking a bit of a run-up. No, that's fine, but I had that a different heading, and not entitled to consider alternatives, whereas you said you're now considering the substance of the... I don't mind at all, but it's just when you've very helpfully given us the structure, it's helpful for me to... Yes. Don't worry about it, Mr. Um, yes, Mr. 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 We'll follow you where you want to go. Yeah. Well, I think my third point related to... Uh, it may be, I just noted it down wrong. Or, or I think much. for the time being... Um, no, do you keep going. I can safely, safely label this as my, third, my, third, my response okay. to the third point. Thank you. Um, so, which comes under the head of substantive assessment of proportionality. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that you put it was, the criticism that you're meeting was that the judge was not entitled to consider whether an alternative rule existed which would, would have solved or ameliorated ameliorate yes. yes. the problem. Yes, so limb three bank mellow. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So that, that, that comes under the head of substantive assessment. Yeah, yep, no, no problem. Um, uh, 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 and uh, I think I pointed this out. Now, now that it's been recognised in SC that manifestly without reasonable foundation relates to margin of discretion and not to the substantive test of proportionality, we're back to Bank Mellet territory. Made that point. And so we see that we still got Brewster open. It's in, immediately below the passage you were just looking at. The test, there's a heading. 66, paragraph 66. Paragraph 66, the test for proportionality. And there's then a, a reference to the well cited passage from Bank Mellon. sees the, the third limb, whether a less intrusive measure could have been used without unacceptably compromising the achievement of the objective. Mm -hmm. I've already made the point that that's consistent with the approach the court practically took in SC, in effect what they must have been applying. Mm. So um, we respectfully say that my learned friend's contention that one, one shouldn't look at alternatives for the purposes of the substantive assessment of proportionality uh, is wrong. Are we right to treat uh, the proof of payment rule as a means of achieving a different objective, in which case the test is three? Uh, as opposed to whether it is itself an objective, in which case the only question is whether it's legitimate. Well, th th that would then beg the question, well, what's the objective? Mm. None's been identified. 
Well, it's, it's been it's been argued by the Secretary of State that the rule supports some of the aims of universal credit in terms of reducing fraud and error. That's the justification, as I understand it, that's been put forward throughout. Yes. And so reducing fraud and error is an aim of universal credit. That is a legitimate aim, um, to take the uh, first limb of Bank Mellor. And one can properly ask whether the rule um, it, it, it is necessary to achieve that aim in the sense that there isn't an alternative rule that could achieve that aim without compromising the objective or could ameliorate the disadvantage without compromising that objective. But I, in my submission, one can't say that the rule in and of itself is an aim. Mm. It serves no purpose of itself. Well, the purpose is to see that you only pay back people what they've paid. Yes, that's the aim. So the question then is, does the rule serve the aim? So that's a, that, that, that distinguishes between aim and means. But there, there, there is a, there it's are, a well-known problem in yeah. proportionality, deciding how you, what you characterise as aim and what you characterise as means. There are some difficult areas. I accept there are some difficult areas in universal credit, because when one looks at assessment periods, one could approach that, at looking at it at first glance, as being simply a rule that implements aims. But actually, it's so very closely bound up with the aims of universal credit that it's slightly different from simply a mechanism by which to give effect to the aims. It's, it's intimately entwined. It's an int integral part of making sure that the system operates in a simple, simple way. Yes. Um, because simplicity is one of the aims and the objectives. So you have a one-size-fits-all rule in terms of, of timings, and that's how you end up with the rather sort of quirky thing that happened with Johnson, yes. because that wasn't looked at, but Johnson's very much on its own bat. Here you say it's not an integral part of the structure. Um, ex hypothesis, it can't be, because, because otherwise you, it, you wouldn't have it with housing benefit. If it was an integral part of the structure that you always had to show that you had all already paid for whatever it was you were claiming back, then you would have a uniformity of approach between this benefit and housing benefit. Yes. And then it would be much more difficult for you to um, show that there was discriminatory effect, or rather an illegitimate discriminatory effect. Yes. Might, might another way of looking at it be, because we know there are multiple components to the aims and objectives here. Um, one aim is to um, make the position of the, the um, universal credit claimant or beneficiary uh, as close as possible to the position of someone who's not, but is in work, receiving their money monthly <coughs> and having to meet their various liabilities out of that fund. And the departure from the cash basis, as it were, um, that we can see in the case of housing is, is just that. It's a limited departure in a specific case, which is different from the case of um, child, uh, the child uh, component, probably because it's, among other things, a, a, the biggest single element of every household's yes. spending. But I think there's two answers to that. The first is that that's never been advanced <laughs> as a justification by the Secretary of State. And the, the second, perhaps more principled response, is that um, replicating the situation of somebody in work isn't an objective in and of itself in the universal credit scheme, but it's something that um, serves the objective of um, smoothing transition into work so as to reduce the disincentives to getting into work. So if, for example, one had a payment upfront scheme of the benefit, but when one moved into work, one moved into a receiving money in arrears, that would obviously be a, um, that would create friction in the move from credit, from, from um, benefits to work. And so, it's only the, 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 the replication of the world of work serves the objective of securing 
entry into work. I so thought, uh, um, I don't want to prolong this debate, yeah. right, but I, I thought that um, part of it was about fairness and um, having um, those claiming this benefit seen to be treated in a way that didn't give them favours compared to the working population who weren't getting this benefit. In other words, you know, equal, equal treatment and fairness, there was a point that, that, that was made on behalf of the Secretary of State. But that's, the, the, that's the justification for the cap. <coughs> yeah. That's the justification for the cap, that you don't get more than your fair share of, of but, but uh, not money. The, not, not for the replication of the... But, but, but not, not, not for replicating the world of work. Um, now, I've shown you that the absence of evidence of ministerial consideration or there's authority for that going to the appropriate margin of discretion. But it does also, it is also capable of feeding into the substantive proportionality assessment. And can I show you authority for that? And it's the case of TP and AR in this court. It's tab, sorry, it's volume two of authority. Tab 27. And this was an Article 14 challenge to a rule that you had to migrate onto universal credit from the old benefit system if you moved across a local authority boundary. Yes, remember this. And if you could please look at page 921. Please read paragraph 127. So the lack of consideration certainly bites at the margin of discretion point, but it may also feed into the substantive question. I think, I think we haven't got the, the, the authority in the bundle, but it strikes me that that's similar to the approach that Lord Justice Mummery took in the um, Elias case. May well be. Um, I don't know, well, if that doesn't ring a bell, then I, I, won't, I won't. Well, such a big judgment. Um, I wonder whether that's a, um, a convenient point, or whether I can yes. deal with one more. No, if, if, if you've reached, in, I mean, clearly we're not going to finish today, so there's no point in sitting on. Um, and that's, if that's a convenient break, roughly how long do you think you will? Um, I'm, I'm certainly not going to be, well, it's certainly not. I think an hour. So. Sorry? An hour, I think, would be a safe estimate. Yes. Well, at the end of the day, it's estimate two and a half days, if that's really what it takes. So, um, these are important points. One advantage, at least, is that on what we haven't done so far, um, Ms. Dolman will not have to be scrabbling together her reply, but uh, can think about the points that you made overnight. Good. Thank you. Quite right.